Thank you very much. I really pr appreciate the opportunity to talk with you, uh, Mayor Turner and council members and um, managers, city managers. Um, I've been working on lead for many years and I will try to very quickly provide some background and some of the problems that we have seen with lead uh, in terms of toxicology. And to start with, I want to talk about the amounts of lead. It's very difficult to get a handle on exactly how much lead we're talking about when you say, for example, the fuels that are part of the operation at, this, at the airport, that there's 1,240 pounds. What does that mean? Well, as a toxicologist, we look back, we try to pay attention to the science. And we know that children are very sensitive to lead. The total tolerable daily intake is six micrograms per day from all sources. Six micrograms is something that's very difficult for most people to understand. Uh, in this particular situation at 1,240 pounds of lead per year, each pound turns out to contain 454 grams. And at this point, most people, you know, sort of, oh, I can't, I, I'm losing it. I don't understand it. Well, let's talk about a gram. If you go to any coffee shop, you will get little packets, and, and these, these are the kinds of packets, equal, sweet and low, splendid, uh, is it splendid? Splenda. Okay, they all have one gram packets. One gram packet, what does this mean? In one gram, there are one million micrograms. And if you have one gram of lead, it will be one million micrograms of lead. So here we, we're talking about six micrograms. And in one, just one little gram, there's a million micrograms. And a million micrograms doesn't look like much when you move it into the atmosphere. It's very small amounts. And you won't even see it. But one gram, one million micrograms, would essentially meet the total tolerable daily intake of 166,000 children. It's an extraordinary problem. And when we're talking about a problem where, where you have 14 or 1,240 pounds, multiply that times uh, 454 and multiply that times uh, you get a million, you start talking about 52, uh, 562,000 million micrograms. This is way beyond what the total tolerable daily intake. And this is part of the problem. We can't get to the basic science without understanding the, the way in which these numbers work. Um, we've been using our children to test the environment. And in medicine, we're not realizing this is a terrible mistake. This is downstream thinking instead of upstream thinking. We're taking our children and using them as the canaries in a, a, a coal mine to find out what the response is to the environment. And it turns out that we have much better ways of doing this, and we can measure the environment. So what we're finding as researchers and within the academic community and within the research community, that basically there's no safe level of lead. That lead is causing problems for irreversible fetal brain damage, for learning disabilities, violence. There's a whole series of chronic and very expensive problems, medical problems, that are associated with lead. These are chronic medical problems. They cost our fortune a, a huge amount of money. Our, our society is is having problems dealing with all of these problems, with these kinds of effects. In May of 2012, 
The CDC agreed with the scientific community, the researchers on the problem of lead, that indeed there is no safe level. Previously, they were saying that the amount of lead that was acceptable, an acceptable exposure was 10 micrograms per deciliter. They have since, since May of 2012, have eliminated the use of acceptable exposure. Now they're using an expo the, what they call a, an exposure that is simply a, um, a reference value. It's a value that's based on the very top exposures that are taking place in our society. So the, the, currently it's five micrograms per deciliter. That should be undergoing a reduction. So CDC has switched to an emphasis on primary prevention instead of using our children to find out how much lead there is in the environment or what other kinds of problems are taking place uh, from the exposure. And they're going to primary prevention. I've been associated with the uh, problem with lead uh, for a very long period of time. I was uh, involved in the hearings before the U.S. Senate on the removal of lead from gasoline. And the initial laws were to remove lead and gasoline in, uh, in 1995. And instead of doing that, after the testimony and, and a number of different uh, people testified, they came to the conclusion that we really have to move it very quickly. And the petroleum industry agreed that they could do it. So unleaded gasoline, there was a very rapid reduction that took place in January 1st, 1986 from lead and gasoline for highway use. At that time, we agreed that we probably shouldn't do anything with air, air gas or aviation gas. There was some concern that there would be freezing out of the gas in the carburetors. We didn't want to see planes crashing as a result of the removal of lead and gasoline. Nobody wants to see that. So we sort of went about, you know, sort of stopped thinking about taking lead out of, ga of, of air, a aviation gas. But now we have a different situation. And I would just want to show you a couple of examples of what took place when, we took, when lead was taken out of gasoline. There was a very rapid reduction, and along with that rapid reduction of the amount of lead in gasoline, there was a 90% reduction in blood lead, in the exposure of children to lead. That's really well understood. And not only in the US, but internationally. Every nation that took lead out of gasoline saw the same kind of reduction. Um, we have been working very hard in trying to visualize exactly what the city looks like. And um, in the case of New Orleans, we've taken a very large number of samples across the city. And when we look at the city in terms of how much lead is in different communities, we find that there's a very sharp increase from the high traffic areas of the city to the low traffic areas of the city. We understand that. We also understand that blood lead follows the same pattern, that children are very highly exposed with the, within the interior of the city and not so highly exposed in the outer layers, outlying areas of the city. And so we've come up, unfortunately, with a situation <coughs> that many children are now excessively exposed and that shows up in their learning abilities, it shows up in their behavior. And the basis for this goes back to, unfortunately, changes in the brain as a result of being exposed to lead. When there's a comparison that's done between adults that were lead exposed, exposed as children compared to adults were, that were not lead exposed to children, we find that there is a reduction in various parts of the brain, particularly the executive function part of the brain, which is associated with impulsive behavior. And this has been very well documented uh, in studies that were done in Cincinnati. 
When we look at the aggravated assault in the city of New Orleans, we find, unfortunately, that children who, um, they, they, when they're exposed in childhood, about uh, up to around three years old, around 22 years later, we start seeing a very similar types of increase in violence with the, in the same children. And this is found not only in New Orleans, but virtually every city in the country, and not only in the U.S., but in internationally. And so when you put those two curves together, it turns out there's a very strong association between the amount of lead exposure during childhood and the behaviors of the same individuals 22 years later. And this is represented by this. There is some precedence for communities to take action on lead problems. Uh, Frisco, Texas is one in, uh, community which had a lead smelter in it. The lead smelter was really right in the center of the city. And the community started learning more and more about lead, and they finally started mapping out the city. And when they mapped out the city, they saw what the problem was. Basically, that large numbers of children were in areas of the city that were, they were getting very large amounts of lead dust and contamination. And as a result of this lead and the map, that was that the citizens saw, they took action and actually have shut down the <coughs> smelter in the center of the city. Well, we have a very different kind of issue in the city of Vero. Vero Beach does not have a lead smelter sitting in the middle. It has an airport where planes use leaded fuel. There is fuel now available that is unleaded. There's a lot of good technical discussion about what happens when you put unleaded fuel into an engine. It turns out that the engines run better and longer. There is no, there is not only lead in the fuel, but there's also EDB and EDC, ethylene dibromide, ethylene dichloride. Those are very caustic to the engine. So when these are all removed, the engines actually last longer. And that's our experience with the automobile. When we took lead out of fuel, suddenly the engines started lasting just as long as the bodies of the cars and the, the uh, mufflers and everything else started, stopped being corroded from the interior. So you have a different kind of problem in Vero Beach. Instead of having to shut down a smelter like uh, Frisco, Texas did, all that's needed is to remove the lead from the aviation gas that's being used. And that's well known that we can do that. Uh, and it, it's, I know it's in the pipeline, there's work to be done on that, but nevertheless, right now, Vero Beach is facing a problem where there's around two grams of lead per gallon in the fuel. And two grams means 560,000 million micrograms of lead entering into the environment on a yearly basis. And that's basically all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Milke.